Okay, um, every um, few months, every six months or so, I'm really, really happy and privileged to be able to come here to CREAF and to uh, UAB and work with Danny's group and see people and say hello. So again, I'm really happy and I apologize for the snow. Um, I come from a snow country and it's my fault that you got snow a few days ago. I had to declare the snow when I arrived at the airport uh, because of 155. Uh, they forced me to declare snow, so uh, I, I, I brought snow. Okay, so we are all interested whether we work on behavior or any other kind of uh, ecological or evolutionary trait or biological trait. We are all interested in the variance there is between organisms that seem to be able to opportunistically respond to situations in uh, ways that use the situation and change their behavior and organisms that have more trouble. So we are very concerned in conservation biology about organisms such as this one who uh, are in danger of extinction and we are often annoyed by animals such as these that are very good at invading areas that are new or um, bothering us in cities. Uh, this is also the case um, not just with birds and many organisms but primates in which you have um, some species that are almost extinct with very few individuals living in pristine habitats and others that seem to be able to cope very well with changes. Um, and possibly some of this variation is due to flexibility in behavior and opportunism. Um, and some of the opportunism might have a cognitive basis. That means it's using more than just the ability to withstand uh, certain physiological conditions or find food, but there's actually something going on in some areas of the brain that are able to modify behavior in a way that we could call intelligent. Um, <clears throat> and one way you can oper uh, operationalize, which means to quantify, to be able to use it in experiments and in comparative work, is to develop an index of this, which is uh, innovations, basically novel feeding behaviors. So um, novel feeding behaviors have been known in ornithology for a long time. For instance, the most famous case is the opening of milk bottles by blue tits in England that was recorded uh, in 1921 for the first time in a small town in southern England. And people have been uh, observing and recording behaviors like this. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of behaviors like this. This is something that I saw in Sitges. So uh, in towns in Catalonia and other parts of Europe, people are very nice to cats. Uh, sometimes these are strange people, um, sometimes these are normal people. And here you have Area de Gats Controlats in, uh, in Sitges. And these are little houses where they have the cats give birth to kittens and sleep and they provide food to the cats and the food is given in the form of dry pellets like you would give to your dog or to your cat. Now the collared dove has been in Sitges only since the early 1990s. It has been spreading throughout Europe and the collared doves in Sitges will go underneath the little houses despite the fact that the cats are there and they will go and feed on the uh, pellets and eat up the pellets. So this is a new behavior that has not been described and obviously there's the risk that one of the cats is going to wake up and be hungry and get the collar dove. Another example is from work we do in Barbados at the field station that McGill has there in which there's a finch called the Barbados blue bullfinch that has been observed stealing sugar packets from restaurants and bars. So the question is, yes, we go to bars to observe this behavior. It's a lot of fun. Um, and this is the behavior that you can see. So here what you have is one of these bullfinches. Um, there you go. So it's trying to find the hole that's already made in this sugar packet. And this is a nectarivorous bird. So normally it eats nectar and flowers. So one way to sequester nectar away from the other birds because it's territorial is to eat the sugar in the sugar packets. So what you have to know is that Barbados is a country that produces sugar and the sugar is usually present in bowls but it tastes very much like molasses because it's raw sugar and British tourists like to put white sugar in their tea. So they import these from Barbados. So all the sugar is produced in Barbados. It goes to the US, it comes back in little packets like this, and the birds go crazy about the little packets. So what can we do with things like this? One of the things we can do 
is to gather as many of these behaviors, novel feeding behaviors that we can, and to do a large-scale comparative study using the trait, just like any other trait in biology. So the trait here is the rate of innovations taking into account everything that can bias it. So, for instance, research effort. So we have accumulated up to now over 3,300 3, cases of innovation in 1,266 species of birds. What we can do with this is to use the quantitative measure to test ecological and life history correlates and evolutionary trends in this kind of um, behavior. So examples of this, they're all inspired by the case of the tits opening milk bottles. Here what you have is a gull taking the milk from the mother over here by uh, what's left when the calf is, is getting the milk from the mother. Here you have a heron not only for, uh, foraging on rabbits but also drowning it so that it kills the rabbit before swallowing it by putting the rabbit underwater and waiting till the rabbit is drowned. Over here this is a chickadee in North America and this is the staple production of, uh, of food in Quebec and in Vermont. This is maple sap from the maple trees for which we make the syrup. So it's getting not just water but it's getting sugar by feeding from this icicle. And here you have a European robin feeding on fish. So these are the kinds of things that we see and record. You have gulls feeding on pigeons, you have crows feeding on pigeons, and in Bic last October I saw a, a, a gull kill a, a pigeon in the middle of the Plaza Major. Um, notice the color of the gulls. If I tell you this is Rome, what do you think happened before the kill? Well, it's Rome, the pigeon is white, and the pigeon was released by the Pope. So it, clearly the pigeons are not protected by the fact that they have been released by the Pope. And these poor children, what we hope is that they do not see the murder of the white doves that they let go. The other thing we can do is to develop an assay that allows us to run experiments on a behavior similar to this. So if we can run experiments, then we can run experiments that look for effects on reproductive success. We can give these problems in the wild to birds to see if this contributes to reproductive success. And we can run experiments that allow us to go as far as we can in the brain to see what the molecular mechanisms causing these behaviors are like. So the kinds of behaviors that we, we look at, so you saw the bullfinch in Barbados feeding on um, sugar packets, but it is also very good and very tame so if you give it an obstacle removal problem, for instance this box with seed in it, it can solve it either by removing the lid over here or by, pushing, uh, by pulling this lid over here. This one decided to solve by pushing. So they all have different techniques. And then we can do this in captivity and make the problem even a little bit more difficult. Bullfinches are very good at this. Um, so the problem here has two steps. First, it has to pull on this thing, and then it has to lift the lid. So this is not training. They're not being taught to do this. They do this spontaneously. This is why we call it innovation and problem solving. It, we could train them to do it by going step by step, but what we do is we give it to them, and then we see if they can do it. So then what we do is do research using these two approaches. So there's the experimental approach that allows us to do all of these things and then there's the comparative large-scale database approach that allows us to do other things. So these 3,000 cases in 1,200 species, there's a phylogenetic distribution that looks like this. So obviously you can't read all of the families of birds here. The point is not that you can see which ones have high innovation rates. There are woodpeckers, there are kookaburras, um, this is Meep Meep the Roadrunner of the cartoons, okay? So there's a coyote falling here behind, and this is a heron, a crow, and a tit. And columbiforms have very low innovation rates, taking into account the um, rate of which they're studied. So the important trend here is that you, could, you see there's independent evolution multiple times. So if all of the low values on this side were close to each other on the phylogenetic tree, then it means that the ancestor was low innovation and that the descendant families are all similar because of an ancestral effect. Phylogenetically, you can see that there's lots of independent evolution. 
So this is the first thing that we can uh, see. The second thing is we can start using this to predict interesting trends. And one of the nicest things that was done with these data is a study or several studies by Danny here who published in 2005 a paper in PNAS showing that you can predict the colonization success of introduced species in the world by seeing how many innovations they have in their country of origin. So if you take birds from England, for instance, and then you bring them to Australia, and then from Australia to New Zealand, the ones that can colonize New Zealand or Australia are the ones that have high innovation rates in England. And that allows you to predict the difference between the ones that can survive and the ones that disappear a few years after introduction. So this is a very nice paper. Um, but what I want to insist on today is the evidence that we've been accumulating in recent years that there is convergent evolution in birds and primates, mammals in general, in these uh, ways in which novel behaviors and brains are evolved together. So primatology also has a long tradition of, uh, I'm, I'm certain I'm going to fall here, and so <laughs> you help pick me up if I, if I get injured? No, okay. okay, you will catch me. Okay, good. Um, so they have a long tradition, especially in Japan, of watching uh, observations of monkeys doing innovative behavior. For instance, potato washing was first seen on a little islet here in eastern uh, Japan in the 1950s. So they have a long tradition, and there's a parallel program of research on primates that's run by Simon Reeder, who was a postdoc and is now professor at McGill. And Simon is doing similar things on primates. And again, what you can see in primates is that innovativeness and other behaviors that contribute to general intelligence also have repeated independent evolution. So the high values and the low values are not bunched together on the phylogenetic tree. They are spread out such that you can consider that Cebus monkeys in South America, which you can see here breaking palm nuts with large rocks, Macaques in Asia, which you can see here stealing things from tourists in Bali. So what they do is they steal things from tourists. They will steal your camera. They will steal your sunglasses. And then they give them back if you barter with food. Okay? <laughs> here, a baboon in South Africa stealing food from someone walking out of a supermarket. And here, the chimpanzees, which show very different kinds of intelligent behavior. For instance, termite fishing. So you have at least four different points in the evolution of primates where innovativeness and general intelligence seem to have appeared. Now, there's strong similarity in many relationships that birds and primates have. So, for instance, the relationship between how many innovations you have and the size of different areas of the brain that are similar to the cortex in mammals is very similar in birds and primates. So, innovation and the cortex, innovation and the pallium have very similar trends. The relationship between innovation and tool use also have very similar trends in birds and primates. The relationship between technical intelligence, so for instance, among the innovations, for instance, you have innovations that are simply this species of bird is feeding on a new food. We have never seen it feed on this kind of flower, so this is new. So this is interesting but it's a food type innovation and maybe this is not intelligent. However, when a shrike takes a mouse, wraps the mouse around a little bit of wood and then pulls the skin off by using this as a lever in order to eat the meat from the mouse, this is a little bit more intelligent. So the idea here is if these technical innovations, those that involve a technique, something new in how you do it, not just in what you eat, if we separate the two, both in birds and in primates, the relationship with the brain is significant only with technical innovations, not with food type innovations. So it's significant in birds and primates, but not for birds and primates when it's just new foods. So there's something about innovations that are technical that seems to involve the brain a bit more. What are the costs? It seems to be a very nice thing to be innovative because you can adapt to change, but obviously why are there still stupid chickens and <laughs> stupid ducks around even though they have 
very uh, low innovation rates and small brains. Well, first they have high fecundity, which is one advantage. But the ad other advantage is that the more innovative you are, the more contacts you have with different parts of the environment that are susceptible of bringing pathogens to you. So whether you look at blood parasites or lice in birds, there's a positive relationship between how innovative you are and how many blood parasites you have. Between how innovative you are and how many lice you have. So there's a cost to being innovative because you're interacting with more parts of the environment. The same thing occurs in primates. So this is a measure that includes innovativeness and this is the measure that shows there's a positive relationship between this measure that includes innovativeness and the number of parasite species. Now what's interesting in primates is that social behaviors that involve intelligence are associated with socially acquired parasites. For instance, the lice that you catch because you're grooming someone else or because you're close to someone else. But environmentally achieved parasites correlate with innovativeness. So when it's social behavior that's intelligent, the cost is socially acquired parasites. When it's individual behavior that's intelligent, the cost is parasites and pathogens that you get from the environment, not anyone else. So again, it indicates that there's a cost that is the same in birds and primates. Here's another study uh, where Danny and his team, Ferran, uh, are lead authors. It looks at the life history basis. So what is the cost in terms of life history? What are the correlates in terms of life history of innovativeness? Well, the ones that are significant are that if you're innovative, your lifespan is longer, your development is slower, and species with a lower brood value, that is species that invest more in future reproduction and not just immediate reproduction, tend to be the ones that are more innovative. So Danny was able to look at the life history traits and the same relationship between lifespan and innovativeness or the behaviors that are similar to it, in this case social learning, is found in primates. So the, especially the primates with more socially learned innovations are the ones that have the longest, longer reproductive lifespans. So I'm just pointing out the points where the two graphs are similar here. So the high points are here, 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 and here. Finally, one study that we can do with um, the large database has been done by Simon Ducatez, which some of you might be familiar with because he was here a couple of years ago. He's returning uh, this May. He's now in Australia and this May he'll be returning to work for a year over here with Danny. Um, he developed a measure of habitat breadth based on species co-occurrence patterns. And the idea here is that you go to the huge IUCN database that has 25,000 vertebrates and a hundred different habitats and classifies all of these vertebrates in each of these habitats with a one or a zero based on the idea that they're present or absent. And then what he does is he looks at co-occurrence of all species in all habitats. And the idea here is if you're a generalist, you will occur in more habitats with more other species than if you're a specialist, in which case you will occur in few habitats with fewer species. And he has been able to validate this measure with, by comparing it to, for instance, a more classical measure that is just based on big habitat categories. And the relationship is quite strong between these things. So he's been able to show that innovativeness is associated with diet breadth and habitat breadth in birds using this very large database. But this is the only point where primates and birds differ. So there doesn't seem to be convergent evolution in the relationship between innovativeness and diet breath or another measure of diet that people take in primatology, which is the percent fruit. Every other measure of cognition in the primates seems to be associated with diet breath and fruit, but innovation is not. So we don't really know what's going on over here, but believe me that in general there seems to be very similar trends, both in the benefits, the correlates, and the costs of innovativeness 
in primates and in birds, which suggest convergent evolution. Now, the uh, other approach that we use is the approach based on experiments. So like you saw previously, we can run experiments with problems and the problem is always obstacle removal because this is the basis of what the tits did in England when they were removing the milk bottle tops. Uh, so we have them remove things and that is the basis of all the experimental tests. So with this experimental test, we can ask whether individuals in the wild that solve <coughs> an obstacle removal test have a higher reproductive success than individuals that do not. And the study was done on tits in Sweden by Laure Cochard. And she tried first to have them solve a food problem where they would have to remove an obstacle and get food by removing an obstacle. For some reason, the tits in Sweden wouldn't do this. Maybe there was food everywhere, so she invented a new task which involved having a nest box. The tits in, the tits in Sweden are used to <coughs> laying uh, eggs in these nest boxes. And then she has a door that blocks entrance to the nest box. And what the parents have to do is pull a string over here, pull a lever, and that opens the door to the nest. And they can then go in the nest box and provision the chicks. So they are highly motivated to do this. Apparently in Sweden, you are not motivated to, food, to eat, but you're motivated to take care of your children. And this is probably social democracy. Uh, the Swedes are very good at this. We could have used alcohol, but we didn't. We, okay, the Swedes have a reputation for, okay. They'll be Finland. Sorry? They'll be Finland. Ah, Finland, yes. Are you from Finland? No, okay. <laughs> Phew, I have to be careful because I make jokes sometimes and there's always someone who's insulted. Danny told me this time don't make any forestry jokes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm bound to make a bad comment. Okay, so these two papers demonstrate that there is an effect of being able to solve this, 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 this problem on reproductive success. So what Lach Kasha has is two different years. So in 2012, the first year in which she did this on a small uh, population, there was a very large effect on reproductive success. So the number of fledged offspring was much higher in the pairs of parents in which both the father and the mother were able to solve the problem than in pairs where they weren't able to solve the problem. And this is not because we kept the door closed and all the babies died, okay? <laughs> the door was, open for was closed only for a short period of time, even from the parents that weren't able to solve. We let them in afterwards. When one of the two parents is able to solve, this produces almost the same effect on fledging success. In 2013, she added a second year in which the effect isn't quite as large. So this is what you get when two parents are able to solve, when one parent is able to solve, and when no parents are able to solve. And the interesting thing is that in 2013, what she did in the second year of the study was to say, okay, so imagine that a parent that's able to solve has eight chicks. Imagine that a parent who's unable to solve has five chicks, because that's the difference. Maybe it's all motivation. Maybe the ones that are able to solve, solve because there's eight chicks yelling, pee, 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 please feed me. And the other ones don't solve because they just have five chicks, and the effect of five chicks is not as strong. So what they actually did, this team, is that they did exchange of chicks in nests, and this works very well in Sweden. The, um, that at a certain age, I think it's nine days, they can take the chicks and move them from one, rest, from one nest to the other. So they added chicks to some nests, removed chicks from some nests, and simply did a control where you just switch but leave the numbers the same. So despite the fact that they did this, they got pretty much the same trend. There is an overall effect on fledging success. On average, the ones with Better solvers as parents fledge a slight bit more offspring over the two years. And the, the way they do it is that their provisioning rate to the offspring is higher. So the parents that are good solvers, when you give them an obstacle removal problem at the nest, 
are the parents that are bringing back food at a higher rate. So it seems that they're both better parents and able to solve problems, and this leads to a higher reproductive success. The second thing we're able to show with experiments is that there's an effect of urbanization. So what are the individuals that are able to cope with cities versus individuals that are, do not live in cities? Do cities make you a better problem solver or is being a better problem solver a condition that allows you to live in cities because life in cities presents many new opportunities compared to life in the normal pristine habitat. And here the person responsible for the study is my ex-PhD student Jean-Nicolas Audet. And the way the study was done is that we took eight different sites in Barbados and we caught individual bullfinches from the eight different sites. And four of these sites are highly urbanized, like this one over here, and four of the sites are not urbanized. This is the typical pattern that you see from Google Maps. And the kinds of behaviors you see from these finches, for instance, they are exploring a fried chicken box to see if there's any food left, and this is just next to the field station. The birds are going to look at this kind of behavior and try to do it. And what we did find is that indeed, they are better at problem solving. So these are all latencies. So the ones that are better are the ones with lower values. So the urban bullfinches succeed faster in the problem that you saw in the first video where they have to find the food in the drawer or the lid. And secondly, they're also much faster than the rural ones in the tunnel problem, which is the one you saw in the second video. They are also bolder, that is, they come more easily to new things, which is not surprising because in the city they get a lot of habituation to the fact that novelty and humans are there pretty frequently and they have to habituate to that. But what mo is most interesting in terms of the cost is that when you do an, immu an immunocompetence test by giving them a protein, injecting them with a protein, and then looking whether there's an immune response to this protein, which is a standard test for immunocompetence, the urban ones respond much more strongly. So again, it's indication that there's a cost to being urbanized, there's a cost to being opportunistic, which is that your immune system is producing at a higher rate because you're encountering more pathogens simply because of the life you lead. You have an advantage in terms of problem solving, in terms of boldness, but the cost is your immune system is boosted. And the um, path analysis that Jean Nicolas did suggests that urbanization is affecting all of the traits independently. So it's not that urbanization affects boldness and that it's just because they're bolder that they're better problem solvers because they're not as afraid to come to the test. It seems that they're all being affected independently by the um, urbanization. Then the final thing that I want to present is the molecular mechanisms at the synaptic level. So how is it that the brain produces innovative behaviors? Right now, the learning and memory that is going on in your brain is being controlled by a neurotransmitter called glutamate and the receptors that are most active in this are NMDA receptors, N-methyl aspartate receptors and the category, the subcategory of those receptors is receptor 2B which is the most important one in the memory and learning process. And this has been demonstrated many times in humans and mice in laboratories. So the idea here is you are all secreting glutamate and the postsynaptic junction has NMDA2B and the NM2B, NMDA2B is transmitting the influx in your brains as the glutamate binds to it. This is what's going on right now. So can evolution produce differences in species production of glutamate receptors that fits with their innovativeness and opportunism in the wild? And the answer is yes. So what we did here 
is to use the species that we've been doing all these tests on, which is your Barbados bullfinch, which is opportunistic. So if you leave uh, tea with sugar in it, they will drink the tea with sugar in it. If you leave milk, they will drink the milk. They will take the sugar from your bowls. They will steal the sugar packets from your table. Um, they are very opportunistic. They're very tame. They're flying around all the time. There is a species that is closely related to them, which is Tiaris bicolor in Barbados, which is extremely conservative. So this is a photograph taken from exactly the same spot in the park next to the Bel Air's research station that McGill has there, in which my camera is simply turned in one direction and the other. In one direction, you've got a person that left a fried chicken. I didn't put this there. This was naturally there. Um, I wouldn't litter, never. This is the cemetery of the St. James Church, and there was some fried chicken there. Okay, so the Barbados bullfinch is exploring this, looking for food. And in the other direction, the Tiaris bicolor, which is the black-faced grass quit, is simply searching for very small seed in the grass and is completely oblivious to the box of fried chicken. It is never interested <coughs> in anything new. It took me 25 years be before I became interested in this species because they never did anything. They never did innovative behavior. They never came into our traps. And then 25 years after, I realized, but they're the perfect control because they don't do anything. They're conservative. And obviously, we've been using walk-in traps for these birds because they come into your traps if you put food. These would never go close to the walk-in traps, so we have to catch both with mist nets in order to get the same sampling procedure with the two. So what's very nice here is that they are very close to each other in terms of phylogeny. These are all Darwin's finches. So you can put the word Darwin's finch in your abstract of the paper. And people love that when you say Darwin's finches. So they are very closely related to Darwin's finches, but you can't work with Darwin's finches. You can't go to the Galapagos Islands and get 20 Darwin's finches and look at the uh, neurotransmitters in their brains. But in Barbados, you can do this with bullfinches and grass quits. You can get permits in Barbados because these birds are all over the place and Barbados is an extremely developed island. So there's the advantage that they're extremely close, they're extremely close to Darwin's finches, but they're extremely different in terms of the way they behave and the way they search for food and the way they're opportunistic. So this one is, this one isn't. They're both territorial and they live in the same habitat. So they're foraging in the same habitat, part of the diet of these bullfinches is not just fried chicken, but also grass seed. So in the absence of fried chicken, they'll, be, they'll, look, they'll look for grass seed, which is the same food that these guys are looking, and they're territorial. So the first thing we do is to give them tests. And if you give them a problem-solving test, the bullfinches all solve the problem very quickly, which is similar to the removal of the obstacle that we saw, but none of our 15 bullfinches ever solve this in the number of trials that we used to measure the bullfinches. So you have an all or none difference in one of the tests. We could go on and on and on and they still wouldn't. So we had to make the test very easy and eventually we got them to solve it. So the point is when it's a problem, they can't do it. When you make the problem extremely easy, for instance, by showing them how to do it, by opening the box, then they can go in the box eventually. But there's a, almost an all or none difference. A second test here of detour reaching, I don't need to explain what this is, but basically instead of going directly to food, you have to go around an obstacle to get the food. The two species also differ in this. This is another test for flexibility. In terms of boldness, the bullfinch again is much bolder, comes to, to, to a new object or a new food much faster than the grass quit. So there's a huge difference in their behavior. But if they're always different, and if we fail to get them to do something, maybe it's our fault. Maybe we are unable to measure what it is a grass quit works with in its brain. So we need at least one test where they're not different, where the bullfinch and the grass quit pretty much have the same behavior. So this is an open dish of seed, and obviously if we're going to keep the grass quits in captivity, they have to eat. 
So this is the way we feed them normally. We give them seed, and the ones that don't feed, we release uh, so that they don't die in captivity. But in one of those two dishes, we've put glue at the bottom of the seed so that the seed look as if they're available, but you can't remove them from the dish. So we train the birds to see uh, so we first tell them, we first give them two dishes with accessible seed, we see which one they go to first. Then in the next trial, we take the one they went to first and we make the seed impossible to take. And that is then the color that they have to learn, don't go there. This is a mistake. So they learn, for instance, that green always has the good seed, yellow always has the bad seed. They are pretty similar in the errors they commit which means going to the wrong color indicating the seed cannot be taken. Once they've learned this well enough, you switch. And this is called reversal. You switch the colors. So now the color that used to say this is the bad seed becomes this is the good seed and this becomes the other color. Again, when you switch, they show the same pattern. So we've got something in which they differ and we've got something in which they do not differ. When you look at the brain size of these two species, they're pretty similar. The grass quid is smaller than the bullfinch, so in terms of the body mass, logged, it's smaller. In terms of the brain, it's also smaller, but that's because the body is smaller, because there's an allometric relationship. But if you look at all birds for which we have a known brain size for this family, they're not really any different you cannot say that they're different. So we have to look at something else, and that something else is going inside the brain in the different parts of the brain and looking at the receptors for glutamate, in particular the NMDA receptor, the aspartate receptor. We're also looking at the other receptor types. So there's many, many receptor types that respond to glutamate. We also looked at dopamine receptors, but that's another story. So, the important thing to remember here is that there are studies that say that the equivalent of the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of your brain that is working really hard right now, the part where cognition and intelligence and boredom, not boredom, sorry, uh, boredom is down here, um, the part of your brain where things are really going on and your glutamate is binding to your NMDA to be, in birds, it's at the complete opposite part of the head. So the prefrontal cortex in you and in mammals and monkeys and mice is over here, but in birds, the equivalent part of the brain is called the NCL, the nidopallium caudolaterale, and it's in the back over here. Secondly, instead of having a cortex, that is a bark around the center of the brain, birds do not have a cortex, their brain is smooth, but it's organized in nuclei, so that the important parts equivalent to our cortex are these two over here, the nidopallium and the mesopallium. So we're going to look at these as the equivalent of the cortex and the NCL as the equivalent of the prefrontal cortex. So when you divide up the different parts of the avian brain and you look at the difference in all of the RNA produced in the brain of different individuals from these species. So we did the RNA, the transcriptome basically, of the different brain areas for these two species and compared and saw where the differences are. And obviously if you're doing the transcriptome, there's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of genes that are being activated. And so Obviously, there will be something like 4,000 genes that differ between the two species, and you don't know what they are. That's the nice thing with this research. By the time I, am, I have been dead for 25 years, people will still be trying to figure out what genes differ, because we don't know a lot of the information on the transcriptome. What we do know, however, is that when you do gene ontology analyses, there are a lot of these genes that are involved in neurogenesis and synaptic plasticity that differ between the two species in the exact part where we predict, which is the equivalent of the prefrontal cortex. So the blue is the innovative bullfinch, the red is the conservative 
grass quit. Now, if you look at all of the glutamate receptors, so this is the transcriptome, but this is also another technique called in situ hybridization, where actually you actually target specific genes. This is, you get everything. So there's lots of false positives here. In this, you target specifically. So we're using only the data in which the two methods show the same thing. Okay? So AMPA receptors and kinate receptors show no significant difference between species. The NMDA receptors show lots of differences between species and in particular differences in 2A and 2B. So with the transcriptome, the 2A is higher in the grass quit, the 2B is higher in the bullfinch. Same thing with the in situ hybridization. A lot higher in the bullfinch for 2B, a lot higher in the grass quit for 2A. Now this is interesting because it is known in humans and in mice that 2A is inhibitory and 2B is excitatory. So the two interact at synaptic junctions to produce memory. One of them causes long-term potentiation, LTP. The other one causes long-term depression, LTD. So we focus on 2A and 2B. So when you look at 2A and 2B, this is what you get when you look at the brain. So this is the conservative species. Notice that there's more expression of the gene controlling 2A. That gene is upregulated. As you can see, it's darker here than it's darker there. And in the bullfinch, it's 2B that is upregulated compared to 2A. In to, to, sorry, compared to the, bullf to the grass quit, in particular in the NCL here. Okay? So what we then do is look at the ratio of 2B divided by 2A. How much upregulation is there in the 2B and how much upregulation is there in the 2A? So what you get, three different methods now, in situ hybridization, transcriptome, and immunohistochemistry, a third method. And again, the three methods show the same thing. NCL has a large difference in the 2B to 2A ratio with the three methods. And there is also an effect in the other parts of what is the cortex. So basically we think we have put our finger on the molecular mechanism for the evolution of cognition in birds. Evolution pushes the genes responsible for one type of receptor versus another type in different directions. Upregulating in one species one and upregulating the other one in the other species. So again, this is evidence that birds and mammals have convergent evolution in cognition. The mechanisms for synaptic plasticity are similar. So this is a figure of the two types of receptors in humans. So in your own brain, those of you that are students or whatever, you are over here. I'm over here. So hopefully my two, hopefully this is, this is going up. But in any case, so when you are prenatal as an embryo and your nervous system is growing, and when you are young as you're learning, the 2B is higher than the 2A. And as you age, 2B goes down with age and 2A goes up with age. So all of us at a certain age that are forgetting things can now have an excuse. It's the 2A. <laughs> Sorry, that's it. The other interesting thing is that you can actually manipulate the upregulation of 2A and 2B. So transgenic mice have been produced in the lab of Zhou Tsien. And when you upregulate 2B, your mouse is smarter, stayed sharper later in life. In fact, their brains retain many of the features common in juvenile brains, including a high degree of plasticity. When you upregulate 2A, you get a decrease in learning in these mice. So that is the demonstration that it's the mechanism because it's causal. 
The rest is simply a correlation. We only have a correlation between two species. We have our species that differ in, innov in innovativeness and flexibility in the wild. They differ in these two receptor types. In humans, the receptor types differ with age. Learning differs with age, but there's no causal demonstration. The causal demonstration here is in these mice, where if you upregulate experimentally the 2B, they get better. If you upregulate experimentally the 2A, they get worse. You'll never catch these mice if they're in your house, by the way. <laughs> so, this is what I want to convince you of, that there's convergent evolution using the same mechanisms at the synaptic level between mammals and birds, and that convergent evolution of flexibility is something that is common to the two groups and occurs in different groups with this kind of mechanism and has this kind of evolutionary and ecological consequence. Briefly, two more projects. The next projects that I'm involved with at CREAF, CREAF is with Ferran Sayol and Simon Ducatez. With Ferran, there are these people in Brazil and the Czech Republic that are able to count neurons. How many neurons there are per part in the brain? For the moment, all we're measuring is the mass of the brain parts, the volume of the brain parts, and these people say, wait a minute, mass and volume mean nothing if you don't know something about the density. Perhaps you're putting more neurons per cubic millimeters, and it's the neuron numbers that are important. We have the answer, and we'll say, no, it's the glutamate receptors that are important, but they don't know that yet. What they've published before our paper on glutamate receptors is neuron numbers. So with Ferran, we're going to see if their data on neuron numbers produces similar patterns that Ferran has, always, has already been able to show in a previous paper, looking at different brain parts. With Simon, because Simon is good at getting large databases from the IUCN, which lists different levels of threat for all vertebrates in the world, different levels of threat for birds. Some species are extremely threatened on the verge of extinction, and others have absolutely no problem and are invading like the house crow. So what Simon will be doing <laughs> was looking at whether we can use innovativeness to predict the status of threat level between birds like this and birds like this. So that's all I have to present today, and I thank you for listening. Um, I hope you were interested. You get more mechanisms than maybe you're used to because you're not a neuro group, but this is evolutionary neurobiology. Okay, so it's ecological evolutionary neurobiology. You can do neurobiology thinking about evolution in natural environments and not just with mice in the lab. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> there are many ways that people define plasticity and flexibility. So many people, if you ask people in the field of animal cognition, some people will say the only valid test for flexibility and behavioral plasticity is the reversal learning test. Some people, particularly in England, don't like our problem solving tests. They say you can only do reversal learning. The problem with that is we find no relationship the, when you test an animal with reversal learning or with problem solving where there's an obstacle to remove, we don't get the same results. So there's different ways of measuring plasticity and flexibility. The problem with this is that flexibility and plasticity is a broad term that encompasses maybe lots of things, but when you have to devise a test, which one do you use? What we've found by using both is that one of them differentiates our species that differ in their neurotransmitter receptors, and the other one doesn't. So I still don't know. Um, yes, plasticity. Yes, flexibility. But how do you measure it? This is at the behavioral level. Yeah. And then at the neurobiology level, yes. the glutamate uh, uh, um, mechanism that you propose. Yes. Uh, that, uh, also being studied in the con context of plasticity as well. Yes, yes. The mechanism, the main mechanism for synaptic plasticity is NMDA receptors of glutamate. It's the, the most... The level would be the 
It would be the same thing. Yes, they define synaptic. The, the greatest, the theories of synaptic plasticity are mostly based on NMDA 2A and 2B receptors for glutamate. There's many, many theoretical and empirical papers on mice and humans. Uh, in neurogenerative diseases like Alzheimer's in humans, there is a 2A versus 2B effect uh, on that, in addition to the plaques and everything. So there's, there's lots of research in, in neuroscience in mammal models showing that synaptic plasticity is very much a NMDA 2A, 2B thing. But the, the, the inhibition of the 2A is important for synaptic plasticity. Because young people, what you have to know is that forgetting is good. We old people forget. But it's good to forget because if you don't forget anything, your brain just goes in overload. A lot of the things we learn have to be kept, but a lot of the things we could learn have to be thrown out. And the 2A is really important because what it does is it says, wait a minute, this is useless information. Don't remember it. Yes. The capacity to copy the behavior of another one yes. take it like an innovation yes. or is less Well, the problem in, in, in primates, the uh, social learning and innovation go together. They correlate very strongly. In birds, they don't. There's a lot less social learning in birds than in primates. There's lots more innovativeness than social learning. So it seems that in birds, for instance, the um, uh, sugar packet opening behavior of um, the bullfinches, because our bullfinches are territorial, they don't learn by observation in cages. They aggress each other, they, 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 they threaten each other, and in the field what we find is sugar packet opening in different places that are not next to each other. They're independently learned, independently innovative. But in primates there's much stronger relationship between social learning and innovativeness. More transmission. Yes. Just, uh, maybe a stupid question, but <laughs> well, this relation with the, is the synapt synaptic plasticity and the immune system is any relation? So we don't know what the relation but is. You see, but <coughs> you know, imagine you are a parasite. Yes. So I use, well, I use in fact this this animal. Yes. This animal will be more successful. Well, initially, the, the, there's, a, there's a large uh, literature saying that, saying that when you are, have a heavy parasite load, yeah. you're less able to learn at the individual level. Yeah, so if you increase parasite load, say, in a group of, ber uh, of animals, the ones with the highest parasite load have more problems to learn. So there seems to be some kind of interaction between the two. At the species level, that doesn't seem to be the case. The ones with the highest parasite load and the highest immune response are the ones that are more innovative. So there, that's a paradox in the literature. And I agree with you, the relationship isn't, um, I don't understand the relationship, honestly. Um, secondly, we are unable to pursue this in Barbados bullfinches because there is a team from Dijon, whom I won't name, that is doing research on parasites and is more friendly with the committee that does the permits in Barbados than we are, <laughs> and that actually said on my permit, you can study immunocompetence, but you cannot look at parasites. Because the team from Dijon is looking at parasites. But I won't gossip anymore about <laughs> <laughs> Dijon. <laughs> this is the politics of research permits and scientific groups. Barbados is a small island. Problem when you have two teams working on similar things, I was there first. <laughs> <laughs> he has no business. <laughs> Anyways. through a lot of parasites. It's funny enough because, I don't know, I'm not a specialist, but I think that in the human genome, you look through it and you look for signs of selection, signatures of selection, apparently, maybe you know better, the strongest signatures you have is with parasites. So it looks like saying, either with birds or with humans, 
that everything we tell you that parasites are very important in terms of innovation, technology, and maybe culture. Yes. Yes. Well, if the, 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 the mechanism by which there's a relationship between innovativeness and pathogens does seem to be an exposure thing. Because the data on primates suggests that when your exposure behaviorally is social, it's the socially acquired parasites that you're getting. When the exposure is environmental, it's the environmental parasites, the pathogens that you're getting. So that makes sense. Um, the other issue is, remember, there was very little theory of sexual selection before uh, Zook and Hamilton and Zook proposed the theory that sexually selected traits are basically traits that are selected in response to pathogens. That basically the pathogens are evolving all the time. And the reason we're able, the, the reason that peacocks are able to produce this very large peacock tail is that they're evolving immunocompetence against the evolving parasites and therefore are in sufficiently good health to be able to produce these traits that indicate. And therefore, the sexually selected traits were indicators of a adaptive response to parasite evolution. So culture, sexual selection, there does seem to be uh, theoretically a huge effect, uh, a, a huge importance for, for pathogens. And obviously they're the ones that are changing much faster than we are. So. <laughs> Uh, they're, change, they're evolving this minute in the hospital. May I another one? Yes, sure. 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 You are looking at innovation, comparing the species, birds, and animals. Did you look at differences in innovation between males and females? There has been work on primates. The primate database uh, suggests that. <clears throat> Despite the story that the first macaques to wash potatoes were a young female who invented the technique and then other young females mostly and mothers learned it and the old males never learned it because they have too much 2A and not enough 2B, um, that doesn't seem to be the entire pattern for primates. So in macaques those innovations seem to be done by females. But overall in primates, the work done by Simon Reeder and Kevin Leyland suggests that males uh, innovate as much as females. Anyway, there, there could be quite a lot of differences between both, both sexes. Yes, and in some cases the innovations are different. Uh, for instance, in chimpanzees, the males have innovated techniques to threaten. So one male very famously in uh, uh, Jane Goodall's troop in, uh, uh, at, at, uh, in, in Africa, used garbage can lids as part of his threat display to scare off other males when he was increasing in the hierarchy. He was banging garbage can lids and the other males were like, okay, 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 you, you, you're, you're the top male here. So you can use innovations in this way. Um, there's lots of innovations that have been done in orangutans, for instance, and, and here again, um, they have a nice situation in orangutans because they take the orangutans that have been captured in, 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 in zoos or whatever, or taken away from people, and they have ha a halfway house in Indonesia where they train them to survive in the forest and leave them there for a while before releasing them. And they observe all the innovations that they do in this halfway house where they have access to all sorts of new things but at the same time are in semi-freedom. Uh, and they've, they've accumulated lots of innovations uh, and the females are producing lots of the innovations. But there's no clear pattern overall. My, my question is about uh uh, within a species, yes. the differences between individuals, yes. uh, you can extend a little bit this, uh, where you see a very broad range of behaviors or they tend to be narrow depending on the, how much conservative or, uh, or not the species is? Yeah, um, the species in which we've looked at individual differences are usually innovative species because those are the species where we get enough differences between individuals. If they're non-innovative species then there's zero innovations or one or two individuals. So you want to look at quantitative variation. So there's the bullfinch but there's also a, car a grackle in Barbados, a carob grackle that's very innovative. And in those cases it's clear that boldness 
and fear of novelty have a strong effect. So the ones that are going faster to something are the ones that are more innovative. Um, they are also, however, the ones that make more mistakes. So depending on how you define flexibility, if you define flexibility by being able to find the solution to an obstacle removal problem, the ones that are fast try many things and eventually get it. But if you use reversal learning, the ones that are fast innovators make many mistakes because they try everything. So there's a trade-off here. Individuals that try lots of things tend to be the bold ones and they make mistakes. But if persistence is required, then they will solve the problem. But they make many mistakes in a differently measured test. They are also the ones that are more exploratory. So if you give them a task where there are cues that can be obtained, for instance, by movement of the lid or the obstacle, the ones that persist in doing the initial behavior, which is trying at the place where they see the food underneath, they are the ones that fail. The ones that are able to stop doing this and then eventually try something else and remove the lid, those are the ones that... So we know which ones fail, we know which ones succeed. And it has a lot to do with figuring out the cues that the environment gives you that allow you to solve it. Last question. I do have a question. Um, some of the, uh, anyone want to ask? Uh, some of the results you have shown um, are consistent with the cognitive buffer yes. hypothesis yes. for the evolution of the brain, yes. which uh, suggests that um, the brain has evolved to produce uh, behaviors to deal with uh, problems, psychological problems, social problems. Uh, so what do you think about this hypothesis? Why you, you never mentioned this, this hypothesis? Um, when you make specific predictions about the cognitive buffer, I think you and I agree on the specific predictions that are empirical. Um, I tend to shy away from general terms like flexibility, plasticity, cognitive buffer, because my personal response is always to do the experiment and make the empirical prediction. When there's an empirical prediction based on the cognitive buffer, then you do those predictions and you get a result that either supports or doesn't, and in most cases you support. But I tend not to use words like that, um, just because it's my own, personal, um, my own personal opinion is that a, a, a word like cognitive buffer is not necessarily useful. Uh, a word like plasticity and flexibility is not necessarily useful because there are many empirical definitions, many ways to operationalize that do not necessarily give you the same result. I'm, I'm, I, f I feel much more empirical than theoretical in, in these things. Okay, so uh, Louis, thank you very much for this interesting <laughs>